Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's award ceremony. I wanna thank you for being here in this unusual way. Of course, I wish we were gathered together here at the museum as we usually are for this occasion, so you could really feel the admiration and appreciation emanating from your families and friends and teachers, but that's obviously not possible right now. And so we'll have to use our imaginations instead, which fortunately is something you're all very good at. This is the 10th year that the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center has organized the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards for the state of Vermont. As you may know, the awards have been in existence for nearly 100 years, and many well-known artists and writers are included among prior year's winners, including Sylvia Plath, and Andy Warhol and Robert Redford and the amazing Amanda Gorman, to name a few. Every year, students in grades seven through 12 from all around the country submit art and writing in dozens of categories. That work is judged on the regional level, Vermont being one region, and then some work is submitted for consideration for national awards as well. Over the 10 years that we've been running this program for Vermont, it's grown to become one of the things that we're most proud of doing here at the museum. The number of students, schools, and works submitted has increased dramatically from when we started. And as you'll see, there's no shortage of talent to be recognized and celebrated in our state. I wanna congratulate this year's award winners, and I also wanna thank you. The reason I wanna thank you is that it gives me such hope to see in your work many of the qualities that I believe are necessary for our society to evolve in a positive direction. Open-mindedness, self-reflection, humility, a commitment to honesty and fairness, the creativity to conjure up something that hasn't existed before, the persistence to see it through to completion, and the confidence and courage to share it with others. These are all such admirable qualities and not everyone has them. So it gives me great hope to see them in you. It makes me feel much more optimistic about our future. Here's how this award ceremony is gonna to work today. In just a moment, you're gonna see a brief video of the exhibition of your award-winning work that's been on view here at the Brattleboro Museum for the past three weeks. After that, we'll hear brief remarks from Chris Wisniewski, the Executive Director of the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the national nonprofit organization that administers the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. After Chris, we'll hear a keynote address from poet and spoken word artist Rajni Eddins. And then we'll hear readings by five students whose work has received a gold key and been nominated for the American Voices Award. After those readings, we'll acknowledge all the other award winners. So with all that said, Let's have a look at some of the award-winning artwork by young Vermonters from throughout our state.
I hope you enjoyed that virtual sampling of what we here at the museum have had the privilege of seeing in person over the past few weeks. And now at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome Chris Wisniewski, Executive Director of the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers. Chris? Hi, everyone. And to all of the Gold Key, Silver Key, and Honorable Mention Award winners in the 2021 Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, congratulations. My name is Chris Wisniewski, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the nonprofit organization that presents the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Today's winners are joining an extraordinary and diverse group of past award recipients, people like Andy Warhol, Kay Walkingstick, Stephen King, and Shabalala Self. Today, you become a part of a nearly century-long tradition, but you're doing so in a year unlike any other. Despite the unprecedented challenges that 2020 has brought, each and every one of you has looked within yourselves and found the courage to express yourself through your art and writing, and that's what you're being recognized for today. That's no small feat, and so once again, I say congratulations. I also want to thank all of the educators, administrators, parents, grandparents, family members who have encouraged you along the way. The Scholastic Art and Writing Awards are a vast national undertaking, and they're only possible because of the exceptional effort of our affiliate partners all over the country who run regional programs, our dedicated staff in New York City, the leadership of our board of directors, and the many supporters who make our work possible. To all of you, I express my sincerest gratitude. Today is a day to celebrate this year's winners, but the tradition of the Scholastic Awards continues. So to all of you who are in seventh to 11th grade, who will still be eligible for the awards next year, I encourage you to apply to the 2022 Scholastic Art and Writing Awards next fall. Thanks so much, and one last time, congratulations. Thank you, Chris. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Rajni Eddins. Originally from Seattle, Washington, Rajni is a spoken word poet, MC, and teaching artist who's been engaging audiences for over 27 years. He was the youngest member of the African American Writers Alliance at age 11 and has been actively sharing with youth and community in Vermont since 2010. Most recently, he's been a featured artist in the Vermont Arts Council's I Am a Vermont Artist project. His latest work, Their Names Are Mine, aims to confront white supremacy while emphasizing the need to affirm our mutual humanity. Hello. My name is Rajni Eddins, and I am proud and honored to be your keynote for this year's Vermont Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. I'll be speaking to you today about my work, the role of creativity in my life, as well as offering you some inspiration as young artists and writers, as this is your celebration. I began as a poet in Seattle, Washington, encouraged by my mother, Randy Eddins, who founded and centered me in a love for language, always having me read and recite her poems and stories and songs. She would often say, with feeling. <laughs> I did not always want to, of my own volition, participate in these recitations, but there was always a magic waiting there to be explored when I relented. I think that's where my love for language was most fostered. Hearing her sing those songs, there's a monster in the kitchen trying to cook and he's giving everybody dirty looks. There's a monster come and see, chewing on green celery. There's a monster in the kitchen trying to cook that tickled something in me, seeing the playfulness of language of how you could take people on journeys, put a musicality to the words and soar 
She also founded, Randy Edmonds did, the first black writers group in the Northwest known as the African American Writers Alliance. And oh, what a blessed experience to be raised in that environment where I was constantly exposed and immersed in the beautiful array of diverse forms of language and self-expression from poets, from playwrights, from short storytellers and prose writers, all of these very skilled, talented, and gifted elders of mine poured into me such that it even more actively accelerated that appreciation for the divine potency of language to be able to touch people's hearts and minds and spirits in dynamic ways that do not allow for them to leave unchanged. So I'm so thankful for these experiences and so happy to, in my life, still be practicing that love affair with the word and have roles in the world ready to allow for me to pour my gifts into. So I use my art more currently as a means to confront white supremacy, to affirm common humanity, to hold space for other youth and people of all ages to discover the love and the magic of language themselves and have a heartfelt connection to their own stories and limitless imaginations. And that is such a gift. I encourage all of you to continue pursuing your gifts, pursuing your writing, your expression. It is supremely valuable in this time where limited imagination can really give way to people's hopelessness and despair. It takes writers and artists such as yourselves to be the way pavers, the portal openers, to see that other worlds are yet to be born and still very much possible. So I'll be sharing a, a few pieces with you now, and I hope you take some inspiration from each of them. The first poem I wanna share with you is called Middle Passage. I wrote this poem when I was about 17 years old, so maybe not too much older than some of you are now, or around the same age. And I was asked to write it for an event called the Ma'afa. The Ma'afa is a commemoration of the Middle Passage, which is also known as the transatlantic slave trade, where many people of African descent were forcibly stolen from Africa and enslaved against their will and brought here to the Americas. And when I think about these people, often when I thought about them as a child too, knowing that they are my ancestors and, and they went through such great travails, I always wanted to write something in their honor, something meaningful, but I felt afraid. I felt it was too big for me to be able to do justice. But when I was asked to write something for this specific event for the Ma'afa, as I said, I felt like that was kind of the universe giving me a gentle nudge to say, hey, it's your time to write this and the ancestors deserve it. So I'll share this with you to say, as an example, there's nothing too big for you to write about. You know, sometimes you may need a nudge, but if it's on your heart to do so and you have a passion for it, I say explore everything that your pen has the whim to encounter and paint with vivid detail because you have a glorious role to play in the self-expression you add to this world and its tapestry. This is called Middle Passage. There should be oceans of tears there should be oceans of tears. This ink is not my blood. What right have I to speak? What right have I to speak? Think my words the salty oblivion to swallow this globe, submerging continents. Mother's one perfect tear for her children. There were children in that small cramped space, giving birth in fetal position to stillborn cosmos, tiny infinites with mayhem as midwife, Below deck, below death, below breath was hope, hidden in heartbeat rhythm. And now sometimes I see our children are below deck, crammed into small cramped space, but the wooden planks are blocks and stoops and streets. 
But our heart beating hope tells me you don't have to live that metaphor. For we are the lineage of stars and suns. Look at the sky and see your reflection. Forgetfulness have us think the oceans dreamt them. But galaxies do litter the sea floor. No one can ever take away our before. They sunk so that we saw. They hung so that we saw. They sunk and sung with tears in their lungs so that we saw. This is not a metaphor. This is not a metaphor. This ain't no metaphor. Middle passage. It's highly important that we honor those who came before us. And I appreciate you for listening. I'm going to share one more piece before I close. And I hope that you receive much inspiration from our shared space together. This is a poem that was written shortly after COVID. Um, and I hope it speaks to the times and offers you some positive affirmation and encouragement. And also recognizing that as writers, you have a great capacity and potential to hold up a light and a beacon to not only illuminating what has been and what needs to be changed, but also what can be. Inside these hands, a golden chance. Within these walls, a castle falls where all the peasants dance. Where does one turn in a house of mirrors? If everywhere you look, there you are. If silence becomes too loud to hear over the bird songs, when touch seems a distant stranger, fuzzy and still wet with hazy memory, no one said anything about the mask we'd wear over the mask we wore before. And yet the sun still shines through gloom and flowers dare to bloom. I saw a patch of onion, a robin thrusting his chest out, eyed me suspiciously as if to say, what are you doing here? It appears we are still here. Maybe we can outlive and outgrow our shadows. Maybe life will look us square in the eyeball and not notice our flinching imperceptibly, or see it and still forgive us our immortal mortalities. Maybe today will be the day, the walls part like seas and the ceilings raise and the light has its way with us. Maybe the rain will merge with the sweat born of our contained lives and become indistinguishable. Maybe we'll take ourselves out of ourselves, cast away the plastic packaging and see something more alive, something more fun to play with than fear and shallow mirrors. Maybe we can be friendly to ourselves even when the world is not watching, when the ceaseless eye of Babylon has gone to sleep or long died. We can be here creating, musing, imagining, envisioning life as it could and can be and leave what it was and is in our wake. Thank you, Rajni. Now, each year in each region around the country, from among that region's gold key winners, judges select five writing entries as nominees for the American Voices Award and five art or photography entries as nominees for the American Visions Award. Then from among all those nominees from each region around the country, a total of five American Voices and five American Visions winners are selected nationally. What we're gonna hear next are readings of the five writing entries from Vermont that have been nominated for the American Voices Award. They'll be read by the students who wrote them. Samantha Aikman, a junior at Mount Mansfield Union High School in Jericho. Elena Hunt, a junior at Stowe High School. Tamia McCode, a junior at the Mountain School of Milton Academy. Benjamino Nardin, a junior at Harwood Union High School in Duxbury. And Eva Wu, a senior at Vermont Academy in Saxton's River. Undone. Last Saturday, I made a carrot cake in a green glass pan with a chip out of the side. We are never really all here. We walk through days with our heads in some deserted cabin we once discovered on the rocky shore of Maine, or in the gutter beside a street lamp in a city we once longed for. What I mean to say is, we are pieces. What I mean is, we don't always have to know what we want. 
The year I turned 15, I was determined to buy a Greyhound ticket and travel south. It didn't matter how far I got or how long it took, only that I was moving towards the light and not away from it. I never packed the bag. I never bought the trip. I am still sitting here with a paper bag of broken glass and an unfinished poem on a Thursday night that was never meant to come. My name is Elena Hunt, and I'm reading an excerpt from my memoir, The Same World, but a little less magical. There's this feeling I get when I know something bad is going to happen. No matter how many times people tell me everything is going to be all right, I know that my world is about to change. I got this feeling the day my parents told me they were getting divorced and the day my uncle died. The first and most memorable time I felt it deep inside me that my world was going about to change was the night I heard the phone ringing with my grandmother's neighbor on the line. My father picked it up. His face went white and he raced out the door. My grandmother's house was in flames. I lay with my mother that night as we waited to hear any news. She told me everything was going to be fine. I kept thinking how I knew it couldn't be, but I couldn't imagine a world where it wasn't. There wasn't a world that existed where my grandmother didn't live in her big house on top of the hill overlooking her farm and the mountains. There wasn't a world where I couldn't explore the endless treasures that lay in her house. There wasn't a world where my cousins and I couldn't rummage through her closet, dressing up in her clothes. Yet in that moment, I knew I was living in this impossible world. When I was little, I spent nights at my grandmother's house that sits atop the rolling hills. The top floor of her house was my favorite. This floor was a loft overlooking the kitchen and dining room. It had one area with a bunch of beds where my cousins and I stayed up late into the night telling scary stories and reading children's books from her enormous collection. My grandmother used to be a librarian, so the amount of books that filled her house was unimaginable. The other section of the loft was where we played. We set up toy cars to race them around or set up her giant collection of wooden toys. It was a space where no adults were allowed and my imagination could run wild. It was my favorite place to be. The night my childhood started to fade was the night my grandparents wonderful house filled with endless mysteries and priceless relics burned to the ground. I remember this day very clearly, mostly because I was so confused by what had happened. It didn't seem possible that everything that my grandmother had owned, everything that had amazed me since I was a child was suddenly gone, vanished into thin air. The TV was on that morning and as I was eating breakfast, videos of our house in flames came across it. I stood there in amazement, watching all my adventures and imaginary worlds burning up. The next few weeks, my father spent trying to document every single priceless item that was in this house. My grandparents were collectors and they had lost all their collections. It has been almost seven years since the fire happened. My grandmother has rebuilt a house on the foundation of the other. Although her new house is very nice, I don't really like it. The old house had been built in many parts by my grandfather and father. First, the kitchen and bedrooms were built. Then a few years later, they decided to add on a living room and eventually a loft was put in. There was so much personality in that house that in my mind, it can't be recreated. There can be the same view and the same kitchen and living room, but the memories aren't there. I can't walk into the house and see my cousins and I playing board games when we were little. I can't see the many birthdays and Christmases that we celebrated there. All I see is a faint whisper of what my childhood once was. When our old house burned, it marked the slow end of my childhood, and the new house marks me turning into an adult. The same world, but a little less magical, a little less exciting, and a little less wonderful. Send me a postcard from Nashville and let me know that you're all right. A stamp cost 55 cents, and you promised I was worth that to you. Swirl the ends of the M's when you write my name. Let your newfound happiness spill out of the cracks of your smile and onto a $1 piece of cardstock. Tell me how you're doing better and forget to mention that it's because I'm not a part of your life anymore. Tell me you've fallen in love. Give me a reason to forget. Use pencil because you're scared the ink will run. Overthink it like you always do. Pretend it's not because you're addicted to perfection, but it's because you care about your words getting to me untouched by nature or USPS, let me pretend it means you care about me, though we both know your kind because you think you have to be. Since this friendship is a formality to you, be formal. Please don't leave me waiting to hear from you by a mailbox in the very decent mountains of Vermont. You promised you wouldn't let go, so keep your lie going. Send me a postcard from Nashville and let me know you're all right without me. Hello, my name is Benjamin Nardine. And today, I'll be reading an excerpt from my piece, Riptide. The water seemed colder than liquid nitrogen as we tested it with our toes, like ice particles appearing on our toenails, regret immediately washing over Madison's face. I knew Madison never turned down a challenge. As I'd expected, it only took Madison a moment to come to grips with herself, 
her roving eyes stilling, her muscles taut with anticipation. Once composed again, we waded into the foamy water, hopping onto the surfboards and paddling out to sea. Now, I'll walk you through it, I said, over the lap of the waves and past the tenacious clatter of my teeth. Surfing is one of the most complex sports in the... I'll get the hang of it, Madison snapped, her inky hair snake-like down her back. How hard can it be? It took me ages to get it right, I said, and even now I'm not, as long as we have fun, Madison grinned, throwing up her arms, showing how steady she was on the board. Life is about fun, Tess. Don't be a killjoy. We paddled out further, the waves undulating with more fervor. I struggled to keep myself on the board as the ocean danced around me. I hadn't surfed in a long time, since my father had last taken me the summer after my seventh grade, almost two years ago. I knew I needed some time and practice so I could pick up the reins again. I glanced over at Madison and was surprised to find her already twisting into one of the building waves, rising to her feet and instantly going flailing into the water. She reappeared, laughing, but I was worried. I said, I told you to be careful. I'm fine, Madison snapped, climbing back onto her board, flushed with excitement as she wiped the salt from her eyes and lips. Come on, she said, let's keep going. I didn't even start. We'll get on with it then. I, ta I taught her how to predict which waves were the right ones to take by scrutinizing their buildup, the anatomy of the surfboard and how to understand it, how it became an extension of yourself, how to master it in relation to the amorphous figure of the ocean, and so many other things, but I couldn't shake the feeling that Madison wasn't listening. After some time trying the smaller waves, I told Madison we should head to the shore for some rest and maybe a slushy. If Madison heard me, she ignored what I said. She sat on her board, staring out at the horizon, eyes unblinking. I'm going to go further, she announced, already beginning to ardently spoon her hands through the water. The waves are better over there. I burst out. Wait. My heart pounded with insistent fury. I glanced around, feeling utterly alone. The beach seemed farther away than it had before, and a sudden coat of fog had settled between it and me. Madison, don't, I tried reasoning. It gets dangerous out there. Nothing I can't handle, Madison retorted, almost out of earshot. I couldn't make myself go after her, farther out to sea. My limbs had somehow become frozen. It was a Friday night. I suddenly felt, felt a sense of worry from nowhere. I quickly told myself it would be fine, just as you roll. When I got home, both my parents were sitting on the couch at a time that they, they would usually be at work. On the table beside, there were some books I had bought by myself. I knew the day was coming. Put your bag in your room and come here, my mom said. I did so, and I can't remember what exactly happened next. I only remember I was screaming, hiding, chased by a beast. My dad grabbed my hair, and my mom sneered on the sideline, and my aunt trying to hide me behind her back. That's all I can remember. I cannot recall how this end, but I remember I become quiet. I refuse to talk to my father for days. I almost hide from his hug and seldom show my real emotion in front of him. It took me several years to forgive him as long as the sadness and the fear of that day blurred out. I don't know what should I learn from this experience. Maybe I'm a betrayer. Maybe I'm a bad kid. I can't, I can't control my desire to read books, but can any kids perfectly control themselves? I experienced how to forgive a person, but not because he apologized to me. He never seriously talked about it. I forgave him because he's my dad, and he always be nice to me in the past year following. From a young adult's point of view, both me and my father made a mistake. The fact that I stole money from my parents to buy book is a mistake, no matter if my purpose was reading, which seems reasonable, but stealing is a crime. Betraying my parents is a crime. My father made a mistake when he chose the worst way to educate a child. He gave me hate instead of a lesson. He never seriously apologized and left me with fear to deal with for five years. Thank you, Eva. That was wonderful. And thank you, Samantha, Elena, Tamia, 
and Benyamino. Now, before I recognize all the award winners, I just want to take a moment to thank this year's judges who gave such thoughtful consideration to the many hundreds of works submitted this year. They were James Cruz, Jackson Ellis, Alex Hyam, Brian Mooney, Veranda Porsche, Cassie Tibbet, and Sarah Ward for writing, and Daniel Chiaccio, Joe Derry, Elisa DeFeo, Jen Morris, Joan O'Byrne, and Vaughn Trackman for, for art and photography. And I want to thank my coworkers here at the museum, Sarah Freeman and Michelle Pizzo, who did a terrific job under very challenging circumstances organizing this year's Scholastic Art and Writing Awards for the state of Vermont. Thank you, Sarah and Michelle. Now, ordinarily, if we were all together here in the museum, I would ask all students who want an honorable mention award to stand and receive our applause. And then I would do the same with all silver key winners before finally bringing up to the stage one by one the gold key winners. Of course, we can't do that this year. So instead, in just a moment, you're gonna see the winner's names appear on your screen. If you're one of them, feel free to stand up and know that all of us here at the museum are applauding for you. And actually, the first group of names you'll see are not award winners. They're the teachers whose students received awards this year. And to them, the teachers, I just wanna say, we are so deeply grateful to you You've persevered under such difficult conditions this year, and you've continued to nurture and inspire these amazing young people. We can't possibly thank you enough for all that you do. Now, after the winners' names appear on your screen, we've got another short video tour around the exhibition for you, so please stick around for that. I wanna thank Brattleboro TV for their help in producing this virtual award ceremony. And I want to thank all of you who have tuned in. I hope we'll see each other in person soon. In the meantime, stay safe and take care of yourselves and each other. Thank you.